We are in 1 Peter chapter 1, and we are going to start in verse 22. We're live all over the world right now online. I'm so glad you're here with us. We're coming to you from absolutely beautiful, gorgeous, sunny Southern California, and I'm so glad you're here uh, wherever you're at in the world. We are in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1, 22. The words of God, having purified your souls, circle purified, by your obedience to the truth, For a sincere brotherly love, underline brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, circle pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed, through the living and abiding word of God, which is what I'm reading to you right now. For all flesh, that's me and you, is like grass, and all its glory, everything we try to get done with our own lives, are like the flowers of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this is the good news that was preached to you. Chapter two, verse one. So because of all that, put away all malice, circle malice, and all deceit, circle deceit, and hypocrisy, circle hypocrisy, and envy, circle envy, and all slander, circle slander. Like newborn infants long for pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up, circle grow up, into salvation. If indeed you've tasted that the Lord is good, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the, precious in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves are like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will never be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has actually become the cornerstone. And he's a, stumbling, he's a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Here it is, but you, but you are a chosen race, circle race, a royal priesthood, circle priesthood, and a holy nation, circle holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. Once you received no mercy, but now you receive mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, circle exiles. This is the verse of our whole series right here. Exiles, not of this earth, passing through, to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. Gentiles is just another word for uh, unbelievers. So that when they speak evil against you, when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of your visit, on the day of his visitation. I just caught you up in your Bible reading for the whole year. (laughs) Hey, here we go. If you got your notes, pull them out. They should be inside your bulletin if you came on campus. If you're online with us at the top of the comment section on Facebook, you'll see a link. Click on that link. My notes will come up. If you're on YouTube, below the video in the description area, you'll see a link. Click on them. Link of my notes will come up. Hey, everybody, pay attention. Here we go. God wants you to not just act different. He wants you to be different. Once you are different, though, here we go. Once God has changed you, once he rebirthed you, now you have to act different. God never works from the outside in. He doesn't try to change my behavior so then my heart changes. He changes my heart because once my heart changes, my behavior will change. Okay? So that's what I'm talking about. Here we go. Once that's happened, once I am born again, once I become a follower of Jesus, I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about a church. I'm not talking about a pastor or a pope or a priest. I'm not talking about any of that stuff. I'm talking about, do you have a relationship with the God who loves you through Jesus? If that is true of you, then here we go. Now, once your heart's changed, how are you going to act now? I'm going to do some heavy lifting in your character. I don't, I care less about your behavior Because once your character changes, then your behavior will change. Here we go. I'm I'm gonna do, this is like the dentist. I'm gonna dig, I'm gonna drill your face. And there's gonna be chunks of it coming out. That's what's gonna happen in your character today as God works um, in ways that we need to change as believers if we're following Jesus. Number one, here we go. 
Here's how to be otherworldly people. Here's how so other people can see Jesus in you because this is different than most people live. Number one, otherworldly behavior. If you're a Christian, near, here's now how you act. Peter describes the, who wrote uh, the book of 1 Peter, right here that I just read. Peter describes the effect of the gospel, which is the good news of Jesus, changing people's lives, as purifying the soul, creating obedience to God's will. A positive outcome of obeying God is a true love for believers and sis, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. So look in your notes. I have the Greek word there, <clears throat> Philadelphia, and it's in uh, 1 Peter 1, verse 22. I told you to underline it. Uh, truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another. The word brotherly love in English is translated from the Greek word Philadelphia, which we have a city named Philadelphia, which is made out of two Greek words, phila and delphia. And philos or phila is love, love of brothers, city of brotherly love. And if you've ever been to Philadelphia, that's not very true. <laughs> Plus there's a bunch of Eagles fans that live there, which is even, which is even worse, okay? <laughs> But here's the thing, that's what the word means. So watch, when Peter writes this, he goes, if you become a Christian, here we go, you're born into a new family, now you have new family members to love. Amen. You are to love your brothers and sisters in the same way that you should be loving your real physical brothers and sisters, even though they're a little dysfunctional and weird. Same thing is true of the spiritual family of God. We have some weird people in the family of God too. And you are probably that person, so don't laugh too hard. But guess what? We all are to love one another. When you become part of the family, boom, now you have a new family. Love the brothers and sisters. That's what Philadelphia means. Do you love the family of God? Here's our principle. God's love should produce love for God's family members. God's love, if God's loved us, wow, God's loved me a lot. I don't deserve God's love, but God loves me. Wow, that's awesome. And I see he's loved thousands of other people. So now my mindset should be, I shouldn't tear down the family of God. I should build up the family of God. Because why would you tear down your own family? Why would you destroy your own family? Right, so that would be dysfunctional physically. So why would I do that spiritually to my own brothers and sisters? And you might be asking me, what would be things I would do to destroy the family of God? I'm glad you asked. Here it is. The change that God makes in people should be seen in a believer's life. Here we go. Here's the drilling. By removing malice. Look in your Bible. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1. So put away. So here we go. This isn't speaking to unbelievers. This isn't speaking to the people out there. This is speaking to you. This is speaking to me. If I'm a Christian, he's saying put away all these things, which means these are believers. These are believers that are doing these things. And these are, this is not what a family of God should be doing to each other especially. Put away all malice. I have it in your notes there. The Greek word for malice means ill will or a desire for harm or injury. Woo! Have you ever prayed to God? God, get him. <laughs> you ever prayed to God like, God, get her. All those pictures are fake. Okay, I'm speaking to the right people. That's awesome. Yeah, you ever prayed like, God, take him, take him down the notch. You ever prayed that God would do something harmful to, to another brother or sister in Christ? Have you ever felt like, you know what, God, they're too, they have too much money or too popular or they, they got too many friends or whatever. And really all it comes down to is just jealousy and envy on your, on your side. But you're like, God, get them. Or they hurt your feelings. Or they did something to you that you're like, man, I'm mad about that. So you want to call like God to go, go do your dirty work? Go get him. Go get that guy's business. Destroy that. Get him. Get him. Man, who made you God? You think God can't handle his own business? You got to step in and start making imprecatory prayers like bounce his head off the cement. What are you doing? These are your own, especially this is speaking of brothers and sisters. Man, why would you want to destroy your own family? Would you pray that God destroys your own son or your own daughter? Or your wife? Or your husband? What are you doing? And Peter's going like, man, remove malice. Malice is like an old English word that just means, I hope, I hope God hurts you. What are you doing? You think God can't handle it? You think God doesn't know what's going on? 
The next word is this, deceit. And you see the Greek word I've got in there, um, it means a decoy or a trick. And it's, it's what you say when you don't really mean what you're saying. It's what you say to try to work the angles. Many of us are angle workers. Like, what's in this thing for me? And we say half-truths or manipulation, and the other person's listening to us, but you're not telling them the whole truth, but you're telling them kind of a version of the truth, and it's like a decoy or a trick to get something from them. It's kind of like what sales guys do when they work around, like, you know, different things, and they try to find a weakness for a thing, and, and they try to work their way into to make a sale. So it's, it's the idea of, of decoying the truth instead of being straightforward and honest and boom, 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 here's the thing. We kind of go, uh, how, can I make, how can I get my way in this situation? Wives manipulate their husbands when they talk a certain way or don't tell the whole truth, or husbands manipulate their wives or their families or whatever, and they're, they're not really honest and straightforward. So um, I did a lot of hunting when I was in high school. I grew up in Minnesota, and we went uh, pheasant hunting and duck hunting in South Dakota. And so one thing you would do is you would set up decoys in the water or in the marsh, and these ducks would just be like, just bobbing along. And if I'm a mallard or whatever, and I'm flying over a pheasant or whatever, and I'm flying over, and I, I see this little group of ducks down there. And I go, oh, look at that friendly group of ducks all gathered together. Let's go check them out. Dinner. <laughs> Dinner happens. Why? Because I faked them out, and it cost them their life. It's one thing for a duck to die, but it's a different thing when humans do that to others and it destroys them financially, it destroys them relationally, especially when people find out you're fake, especially when people find out they've been used. That's what it means. It means when you use others in a way that deceives them. It's a decoy, it's not true. The next one is this, hypocrisy. You see it in your notes there? Uh, I've talked about this before. Hypocrisy is a Greek word that means uh, like a stage actor. It's kind of like if you go to see your daughter do a play or you go see the Nutcracker at the Pantages Theater or whatever, and all of a sudden, you know, there's ballerinas and there's people doing these things like this and whatever, whatever else they do at a Nutcracker. And so the thing is, though, if you walk, if you run into the ballerina, one of the ballerinas like at Vaughn's getting ice cream, you know, she's not running around doing this, usually, in the ice cream section. She's getting, and you're like, whoa, you're a totally different person than I saw you at the Pantages Theater. And she's like, yeah, did you think I was just running around doing ballet stuff like all over town? Like that's, that was a play. So I acted that to make you believe I was that thing, but off the stage, I'm not that thing. So it's one thing to be in a play that you know isn't true. It's another thing to live out a life that you know isn't true. It's one thing to be here on Sunday morning and go, I really love God. And then Friday night, you're getting bombed with the Marines at, uh, in Old Town at the Stampede. And he's stumbling out going, you should come to the orchard with me. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about. The point is this, you're the same wherever you go. You're the same Sunday morning, you're the same Friday night, you're the same two in the morning in Vegas. You're the same everywhere. You're, you're a follower of Jesus. You're a man of God. You're a woman of God. Wherever you go, you take God with you. Amen. That's what it means to not be a stage actor. That's literally the, the, the idea of hypocrisy. I'm one thing here, I'm a different thing here. I'm just like a shapeshifter. No, you're always the shape of Christ. And then envy. Um, this one's very similar to, uh, to malice, but it's the other side. It means I'm really jealous. Look at my eyes. Everybody look at my eyes. We live in a jealous culture, which is insane. Social media is built on jealousy. It's built on, check out this vacation I went on. Check out this outfit I'm wearing. Check out this thing I've got. Check out this new relationship I'm in. And then everybody that doesn't have those things goes, man, I can't even get a date. And you're on like date 43. I wish I had a husband. I wish I had a wife. I wish I had kids. I wish I had that car. I wish I had that vacation. I wish I had, I wish, I wish. It's built on jealousy. Like all, almost all social media is built on, you don't have this. Why don't you have this? And I'm going to tell you right now, listen, if you don't get control of jealousy in your life, because this is a weakness for some of us, it will destroy all the good things in your life. Even the kid is like, listen to what I'm saying. Ready? <laughs> this is for real. Ready? If you don't get control of jealousy, it will destroy all the good that God's doing. It's insane for a culture 
that has everything that you could ever ask for. We're the most blessed culture in the history of humanity since Adam was made in the Garden of Eden. We have the best health care that, that you could just wander into and get surgery done. We have God's word in our language. We have this beautiful place to worship. We have the 15 freeway <laughs> that's being constructed. And sometime within our lifetime, hopefully it'll work. Like we have the best of all things. Most people would trade, trade your life for their life in a second. They go, I don't know what you're dealing with, man. I'll take your life every day of the week, man. I'm living over here in, in this country where we don't even have running water still to this day. So stop this craziness where you're just so jealous of like what God's doing in other people's life. Why does it matter how much God blesses someone else to you? You already have more than most people have ever had. And you're still mad about it that you don't have something someone else has. What do you, some, and some people are jealous of, of areas of your life. So we have this weird like dysfunctional jealousy of other people when they're jealous of things that you have got going on in your life too and it's, it's sinful and wrong. Here's how you deal with jealousy. Look at me. Here's how you deal with jealousy. The minute it comes up on your phone, you hear about somebody's getting something good, cool, you know what you do? Instead of being jealous, you go, I'm so happy for you. And mean it. If it's online, you see their picture of their vacation that you wish you could have gone on, but you couldn't afford a $10,000 trip to Tahiti, and you want to just go, block. But no, you know what you do? You go, like. And then you comment with your little thumbs, I'm so happy that you and your family went on that beautiful vacation. God bless you. <laughs> and then you press send. And guess what? You'll feel all the jealousy drain out of your life when you realize, number one, you're blessed by God as well. And number two, who cares what God's doing in someone else's life? Pray for their blessing rather than their hurt. Why, should, why do you care if God blesses somebody with something? And, or Because you're being blessed with things that other people didn't get either. So stop with envy. And then uh, the next one, slander. Look at it in your, in your uh, notes. It means to backbite. So when my son was about two years old, uh, we, dad and son were wrestling around and he was like, he jumped on my back like a wrestler and tried to choke me out. To which I chucked him in the street. No, he was like, <laughs> he started trying to choke me out and I was like wrestling him around. And, and then he bit me <laughs> on the back of my shoulder. I'm like, ow, and then I really did throw him in the street. No, he like bit me. And that's the idea of the word. The Greek word means a backbiter. It means stuff that people say behind your back. It means all the trash that goes on that you don't know about or that some, somebody's speaking about you behind your back. That's what the Greek word for slander is. Slander is gossip armed with a knife. And it's the idea of speaking of things that you have no right to be speaking about. Let me tell you, let me show you what I'm talking about. Let me give an example of of slander. So humans struggle with gossip and slander. And these are three people. This guy's kind of short. <laughs> so these guys have a relationship. They talk to each other. They are at work together or they're at the gym together, whatever it is. At some point, though, they get into a problem. There's an issue. There's fighting. There's misunderstanding. There's whatever it is. And instead of dealing with it, these are Christians now, speaking of Christians, instead of dealing with it biblically, Matthew 18, go to them, you know, you've offended me, or blah, 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 I misunderstood this thing. What was that thing that kind of blah, 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 I kind of hurt my feelings, blah, blah, blah. Instead of doing that, they don't deal with it like that, and poison starts to happen in that person's life toward them. And what happens is, is it just kind of sits on the bottom for a while. And you kind of don't realize it's there until things get stirred up. Some issues happen, some problems happen, and then all of a sudden, this person is poisoned against that person. It's ungodly, it's unholy, and all of a sudden, instead of dealing with it correctly, they now go and tell somebody else, and they poison that person towards him or her. They don't even have a relationship yet, but watch this. When they meet someday or they get connected, all of a sudden there's a predisposition to hating that person. The reason slander and gossip is bad is because we love to tell people stuff. We just want to run down the hallway of our office 
around, and these people have never met, they've never connected, but the minute they do, this person already doesn't like that person, and there's no reason for it. And now this, this relationship's already on bad foundation because of this person's sin. And I want you to understand something. When we talk about slander, when we talk about gossip, this person is innocent. And this person's saying stuff to this person that should never be said. And now this person believes something that might not even be true. You ever heard of the internet? I mean, literally, this is almost all of Yelp. Like, somebody gives a bad review. Oh, the bread at this uh, restaurant was horrible. Like, I was just, it was kind of cr- kind of crusty. And they write a review. Oh, don't go to this restaurant. And then this person reads it. Like, I read that review. I heard the bread at, you know, Mephibosheth's bakery is horrible. And all of a sudden, they start telling their friends, yeah, you know, I was going to go out tonight to Mephibosheth's bakery. I'm going to stop using that because I can't keep saying that word. But uh, we're not going to go there. You want to know why? I heard the bread's bad. You've never put the bread in your mouth, son. What are you talking about? You're now poisoning other people based on what some dude back here said that you don't even know if it's true. You don't even know if he actually even went to the restaurant. And you're, you're like the champion for the br- bad bread eaters. Don't eat over there. I heard it's horrible. What are you, who, why do you care? Why are you opening your mouth? Dude, shut your mouth. And talk about something godly with your energy rather than tearing somebody else down. You don't even know if it's real. What are you doing? Here's the thing. We all do it. It's part of human nature. Some of us are weaker in this area than others. All this just garbage just goes around about churches, about like, oh, did you hear about la, la, la? Dude, you don't even know if that's real. And the person that be saying it, they might totally not even be telling the truth because they're just bitter and angry. And you should be connecting with this person in a real, holier, godly way, but instead your mind is poisoned. Like some of our lives might be perfectly encapsulated by this meme. Look at this meme. When you want to say it, but the Holy Spirit be like, shut. (laughs) Shut your hole. Hey, you know what? Gossip and slander is horrible, and it's sinful. It's the reason sometimes people don't keep a job. You want to? I, I get resumes all the time, and you know one thing I look for: how long has this person been out of job? And I can tell if they've been there only a year or three years or whatever. I go, I don't even want them, because they keep bouncing from job to job to job, and they think, oh, it's a toxic culture. They are the toxic culture. They're the problem. But they're telling everybody else, oh, it's, it's toxic. It's toxic. To blah blah blah. It's like, what? You're the problem. It's the reason that you can't land somewhere for longer than, because after a while, everybody gets tired of your dog and pony show and you get booted. Or you get so upset about whatever and you just leave the, you leave the environment worse than you found it. That's the issue with, with gossip and slander. Immediately stop. Immediately go like this. When somebody comes down the hallway, hey, did you hear about? No, I didn't. I'm not interested. Hey. <laughs> One person's excited. Here's, here's what it is. Here's literally what it is. Hey, did you hear about blah, blah, blah? No, you know, I did hear something about that, but I'm not really interested in talking about that. Let's talk about something else. And all of a sudden, boom, you shut down all the issues, even though your ear's like, oh, I'd love to hear about that. No, you know what? Show some discipline as a man or woman of God. You think you're mature? I'm super mature. Then stop listening to gossip and spreading it yourself. Because that's not what men and women of God do. Why destroy the family that you're a part of? And when people want to talk about you, you just, or they want to go, hey man, I heard your hurt feelings got really hurt, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you know what? I'm dealing with it. Thank you, though, for checking in. But don't you want to talk about it? Like, how are things? Like, I'm good, man. I'm dealing with it, I said. I'm good. No, but you know, no, bro. Shut your hole. <laughs> hey, people love to talk, but let's make sure our talk is godly and uplifting rather than destructive and toxic. Number one, otherworldly behavior. There is no perfect church, just imperfect people worshiping a perfect God who are trying to be more like him. I think it's kind of funny when people bounce over the orchard and they go, oh, there's a bad church over there. We're over here now. I go, you might have been the problem, so don't come here. (laughs) Just keep on bouncing down the freeway. 
Hey, ready? There are no perfect churches. You're not perfect, I'm not perfect, only Jesus is perfect. So here's the thing, but here's the, here's the thing. If you come someplace, go, I want to be a functional part of, this, of the family. Hey, if you're looking for an unjacked up place, you will never find one. If you're looking for a bunch of jacked up people, welcome. Because <laughs> you're jacked up too, so welcome to the family, okay? But here's the, here's the goal. Our goal is, I don't want to be jacked up anymore, I want to be like Jesus. I want to stop being jealous. I want to stop doing slander. I want to stop being a hypocrite. Like, let's, so let's work on these things. That's why we do this stuff. It's like, let's do the surgery and then let's all get better. God is dishonored when believers tear each other down rather than build each other up. The most miserable believers are those who produce gossip and toxicity rather than provide health and healing. Hey, if, especially if this is a struggle for you, you will be miserable in your heart because you'll never have peace from God until you get control of your tongue. The most empty, angry-ish, anxious people are ones that just feel like they have to talk about things. Just go, nope, I'm good with God. God's got me, God's got the situation. I don't have to talk about it, I don't have to poison anybody else's mind. I can deal with it, I can talk directly to that person. Let's deal with it in a healthy way that, rather than an unhealthy way. Here's our principle, be known as a drama killer, not a drama creator. I should have made that the whole sermon. Hey. Be known as a drama killer, not a drama creator. Because here's the thing. You start poisoning other people's minds, you know what happens when, when they start going around telling people, then they realize, man, I shouldn't tell this person anything because they're going to tell everybody. So the gossip that you spread is telling other people, whoa, they're a gossiper. So the, it's actually destroying your credibility when you go around talking about other people because then they go, I'm not going to tell them anything because I know it'll get around. There's massive benefits in having self-control in what you speak about. So here's the thing. Always speak about godly things. Amen. Which brings us to uh, Ephesians 4.29. I put all those Proverbs verses in there at the bottom of the first point, and you can read them yourselves. But here's Ephesians 4.29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. So then what should I talk about, God? But only such as good for building up as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Number one, otherworldly behavior. Number two, otherworldly appetite. Once people are born again, they have a new desire for godly things. Like a newborn infant has a natural craving for his mother's milk, one of the strongest cravings for believers is the hunger to hear the word of God. Wow, hey, look at me. When pe Our church is exploding. It continues to, it's just crazy. It's a miracle, it's a work of God right here at the orchard, it's crazy. I, was, I just did a wedding last night in good old Bakersfield. So I drove home, I just blasted home. I didn't even finish dinner. I did the wedding, didn't finish dinner. I, me and my wife just jumped in the car because I wanted to do this sermon today. And so I'm cranking down the grapevine, risking my life with every other semi-driver driving like this. And you know what? When I married them, when I married this couple, uh, they now, those families came together. And it was a beautiful moment of families that were separated now, now together through the marriage of this beautiful uh, man and woman. And one of the people that had visited was at our church, is in the Coast Guard, they moved into Texas. And so he's like, it's, it's all right here. And I go, well, how's it going? He goes, I cannot find a church that teaches the Bible. And I go, that's like going to a medical office going, we just teach knitting. Like what, if, what else is there? And he goes, you, you wouldn't believe it? I go, come on, man, this is Texas. Like, there's a bar and a church on every corner in Texas. And he goes, you wouldn't believe it. Like, I'm, we're having a hard time, like, just, like, finding a place, like, what happens at the orchard. Like, and the two things that people talk about when they come to here is they go, I hear the actual Bible opened. We actually open the Bible. We don't just reference the Bible. We teach the Bible, number one. And number two is, like, the people here are just unbelievable. They're just amazing. Like, from the parking lot in, I just, it feels like family. Like, it feels like somebody cares. I was like, man, that's, those are two of the best things that you can find. You find a church like that, you found gold. Because that's what God desires for all of us is to learn God's word and then to start being men and women of God. Nothing can replace the clear teaching of God's word. You should have an appetite for God's word. Like a newborn infant craves its mother's milk, like it's built for it by God. When you become a Christian, you should just thirst for it to hear God's word taught. It should just be a, an insatiable, before I knew Jesus, I was like, I know the Bible, like whatever. But man, when I became a Christian, the Holy Spirit just like was like, I had an insatiable desire to learn God's word.
And I hope that's true of you. I hope you just hunger and thirst for the words of God because you're built for it. And lastly, number three, because if, if I had to close up and I left one blank, some of you guys would go crazy. <laughs> what was number three? Here we go, otherworldly race. I don't have time to get into all this. Uh, I ran out of time, but I will say this. Ready? As God's family, believers are a chosen race. They're a royal priesthood and a holy nation. They are not to act like the world, but like exiles as people of light. Our behavior may be hated or mocked because we love Jesus, but behaviors can't deny their godly lineage. I'm gonna leave you with this nuclear bomb. Everybody look in my eyes. Hey, if people are racist against you, make sure it's because you're of the race of Jesus, people. Hey, ready? When you become a Christian, all other things fade. Your skin color, your socioeconomic status, where you were, you're not a Mexican anymore, you're not a Norwegian anymore, you're not a black person, you're not a white person, you're not an Asian, you're now a Christian. And Christian changes who you are. So, I don't have time for clapping. I don't have time for clapping. Ray, hey, listen. Hey, ready? Peter says this, you're a, you're a chosen race. You know the Greek word there? It means you're now a new people group which means it doesn't matter what your skin color is, doesn't matter how much money you have or don't have, doesn't matter where you come from or where you're going, it matters who you are in Christ. So when you're now a new race of people, if people are racist against you, make sure it's because, man, I hate Jesus in you. It's because you're so much like Christ that now you are, you're repping Jesus. Amen. That has to be your new identity. And so now because that's true, let me act in a new way. Let me let go of gossip. Let me let go of slander. Let me, let me be a man or woman of God now. That's what matters.